Water mills usually consisted of two main buildings. The first building contained the grinding mechanism, while the second one was the water tower. The water flowing along the mill channel led to the top of the water tower. The main water mill building was internally divided into two rooms by a lower wall which usually did not reach the ceiling. These two rooms included the grinding area and the residence area for the miller and his family. Some water mills also had an extra area, located next to the residence area, used as a storage room and a reception area for customers. The second structure of the water mill was the water tower. This stepped construction, containing a cylindrical water chute, was built on a slope in order to allow the water to gain greater propulsion. At the top of the water tower was a large funnel. The water flowing through the mill channel was led to the entrance of this construction, the upper part of which was in the shape of an upside-down cone. Its three sides were almost vertical, while its backside, where the water flowed, was angled. At its lower part, there was a metal grid to keep debris away from the water mill. The lower part of the chute, made of chiseled and fitted cylindrical stones, had a gradient of around 30 degrees from the vertical axis. The chute ended with a large stone, the siphon stone, which was set into the wall of the space accommodating the moving parts of the mechanism. This large stone had a chiseled opening in its center, the siphon. At this opening, they fitted a wooden spout reinforced with metal bands so it could withstand water pressure. Its incline was adjusted with wooden props. The water would come pouring out of this opening, having acquired a great amount of propulsion in the chute, and would set the moving parts of the grinding mechanism into motion. Through an arched opening, the water would flow out of this area and then through the mill channel towards the next water mill. The movable part of the grinding mechanism was based on a rectangular piece of wood fixed to the floor of this area. A metal blade was screwed to this rectangular piece of wood and a metal bullet was placed inside the blade hole. The spindle, a vertical wooden axis, rotated on this metal bullet. The bottom part of the spindle had a wedged iron post tangential to the bullet in order to withstand friction caused by rotation. The spindle had a perforated wooden part, the drum, which was battened down with a metal peg as well as wedges. The fan or water wheel was fixed to the drum. The water wheel consisted of wooden radial parts called spoons. The water wheel spoons were fixed to the drum and were fastened firmly with a metal ring as well as additional props. On its way out of the siphon, the water would fall on the spoons, causing the water wheel to rotate. The movement was transmitted from the water wheel to the spindle and through the spindle to the grinding part of the mechanism, that is, the millstones, which were located on the upper floor in the grinding area. On its upper part, the spindle had a wedged metal post going through the hole in the middle of the bottom millstone, which did not move. In the hole, there used to be a piece of wood which protected the bottom millstone from friction due to the rotation of the metal axis. The metal axis ended in a broad metal bar called the bridge. The bridge was fitted into a chiseled opening at the bottom part of the runner stone. This way, it fastened the runner stone and at the same time transmitted the rotational movement of the movable part of the grinding mechanism. The distance between the two millstones was adjusted with a vertical wooden axis fixed in the bearing beam of the grinding mechanism. The upper part of this axis was penetrated by a metal peg which was fixed in a prop, usually made of stone, and located on the ground of the upper floor. The height of the prop determined the height of the grinding mechanism and the distance between the two millstones. The grain to be milled was put in a wooden cone-shaped container called a hopper. 
From the bottom part of the hopper, the grain would fall into a metal funnel. Next to the funnel was a metal extension of the spindle, which went through the hole in the middle of the runner stone. This metal extension vibrated the funnel. With the vibration of the funnel, the grain would flow into the hole of the runner stone and was transferred in between the two millstones where the milling took place and the flour was produced. Due to centripetal force, the flour was directed towards the periphery of the millstones and was gathered in a wooden container encasing the millstones. From the exit of this wooden construction, it would then flow and be gathered into a flour chest.